welcome to the Green Building Show, where we investigate green design and building trends throughout Australia. Hi, this week we'll be speaking with Justin O'Neill, an architect who's created a lightweight and sustainable home on North Strabok Island in Queensland. We're also going to be speaking with Victoria Lee, who's going to bring us this week's hottest product, and we're going to answer your questions. But first, we continue our investigation into the carbon neutral home. I speak with Paul Davey, a South Australian developer who's won a state government competition for a carbon neutral home design. And once it's built, it could well be Australia's truly first carbon neutral home. So I'm here today with Paul Davey, he's the director of TS4 Sustainable Living, a South Australian based developer who has uh, recently won South Australia's Land Management Corporation's Zero Carbon Challenge. And so Paul, thanks for being with us. Can you tell us what is the Zero Carbon Challenge and how did TS4 Sustainable Living become involved? Yeah, sure, no, thanks for having me here, Carlos. Um, it was a state, South Australian state government competition uh, that was um, ran early to mid last year. Um, they um, provided some land at the Nocturne Park uh, Green Village in, in Adelaide in order to um, allow uh, builders and developers to create um, what would hope to be the um, the next generation of um, certified zero carbon um, housing. And so I guess what were the requirements for the entries and how did the TS4 design really stand out from, from the other finalists? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, there, 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 there were some fairly, fairly straightforward requirements. It had to be a, a three-bedroom home, had to be two storeys, had to be affordable. So it had to be built under a under a construction value of less than less than three hundred thousand dollars, it had some performance requirements. Had to um, get a minimum seven and a half star home energy rating, uh, meet the um, uh, urban design guidelines down at Lockyer Park, which are, which are fairly uh, fairly stringent. A big big focus on orientation and um, some, some natural ventilation and, and uh, uh, landscaping. Uh, importantly, it had to be. Um, had to be carbon neutral uh, within a 35 year time frame taking into account all embodied and all operational uh, emissions and it also had to be demonstrable as a, as a livable space so it wasn't just so much about the environmental performance can you can you elaborate a little bit more on that um, on that Paul what what do you mean by the 35 year um, time frame yeah so um, uh, we had to account for the um, the, the predicted emissions in the in the actual construction of the, the house, so the, the materials, but also looking at how you know with a, with a typical family, um, how the home might actually be used, and ensure that over the life of the, the home, and that was that was set by state government at 35 years, um, it's, uh, it's it's total emissions would equate to zero or less. It would actually become carbon positive over its life. So um, that was that was, a, that was that was quite a challenge. We we um, uh, we uh, our design had um, had it becoming carbon neutral, including operational emissions by um, year thirty two. So we beat that by some some margin. Okay, so I guess when someone moves into the home, it's not carbon neutral straight away, but it's carbon neutral after a certain period of time. Is that how it works? Yeah, that's that's right. So yeah, so how it works is um, uh, the 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 main way that the operational and the embodied emissions are offset are by um, we've got a, a quite a large um, photovoltaic solar array uh, on the roof of the home. It's about a three kilowatt array, and that. Um, that basically begins to pay back the um, the embodied emissions in the in the home and also the operational emissions that are, that are starting to run out. In your opinion, it was the most challenging hurdle when it comes to constructing a carbon neutral home from the from the design aspect. What what, what has to change in order to, to come up with a home which is going to be carbon neutral? Yeah, look, I think it's um, if we're going to take into account operational emissions as well, it's getting the it's getting the, the getting a real a really good combination of um, uh, as, as small an embodied footprint as possible in the actual construction of the home. So using locally sourced materials, I think, is important. Using more natural, renewable materials as opposed to you know, very high energy materials like aluminium or, or steel. So using lower emissions materials like timber, um, natural aggregates, recycled. 
recycled material is all locally sourced um, is key. But I think um, uh, one of the important things to, to really focus on is getting the balance right between the, the sort of the carbon accounting, the energy profile of the home, and livability. And I think that was one of our key standouts between us and some of the other um, finalists, and perhaps was one of, one of the reasons why ours was. Um, was promoted as, as the winner. And that's if you look at a lot of um, low or you know, net, net, net zero emissions homes or low energy or zero energy homes, they tend to follow a similar kind of aesthetic. They're either very, very, very small windows and, you know, in order to minimise the, the direct solar gain, they, they quite often they look quite rural in, 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 uh, in their look and feel. And I think... Um, I think it's like anything to make it to make it livable it's got to be I think contemporary, you've got to get the balance right between energy saving and access to daylight. So we've got if you look at the north elevation of the house, it's, it's quite extensive glazing. Um, but it is double glass, it's well shaded, there's lots of external green shading, but we're pulling lots of daylight into the, the home, we're allowing the windows to be open at appropriate times so that the home can be fully naturally ventilated. And so I guess what did you as the developer and, and, you know, in, in collaboration with the architects have to do differently when designing this home? Yeah, so it really was um, uh, it really was covering all those bases. So, so I mean, a, if you like, a traditional house builder would, would still need to get a home energy rating of a certain star level to comply with, with code. There'd be some code requirements for um, thermal performance, so that would all be met. There'd be a few issues there. Um, but a, a, a traditional house build doesn't have to take into account the embodied carbon. Mm -hmm. um, so um, carbon, carbon accounting is, is quite a big um, a big point of difference with this one. And I think the way that we're looking to develop this and, and other homes is also perhaps a little bit different in that we are taking each site and each property on its own individual merits. So we're not sort of picking up a cookie cutter and trying to sort of punch them around different plots. And I, and I think that's key as well. You've got to look at orientation. You've got to look at, you know, the... the um, opportunities that each site provides you in terms of solar access, shading, uh, um, prevailing wind conditions and um, etc. so that you are creating a home that responds best to its local environment. In your experience as a, as a sustainable developer, Paul, is it possible to build a, a home which is carbon neutral from the, from the get-go rather than having to wait 30 years? Not where, where we are right now. Um, there isn't at the moment uh, any way of making every component of the home in a carbon neutral manner uh, and what I would describe as an authentic carbon neutral manner. So if you, I mean, if you were to purchase all of your, um, your materials from manufacturers who had carbon, um, you know, footprinting processes in place and if you fully offset all of your um, footprint by purchasing um, offsets, um, then you could say that your home was carbon neutral from the get-go. So, but that would be a process of purchasing uh, offsets. Um, uh, so things like you know uh, buying offsets from organisations that um, uh, you know invest in you know forestry commissions and planting trees in lieu of the emissions that mm -hmm. you actually spend doing doing whatever you're doing. But I don't see that as being particularly authentic. Paul David, thank you so much for your time. That's great, Carl. Thank you. So Victoria, I hear it's all about pedal power this week. What have you got? Well, it's actually the world's first cardboard bicycle. Um, the story's been around since about mid this year, but it's really kind of cracked into the mainstream this week. Uh, an Israeli designer has invented what he believes is the world's first cardboard bicycle, which is super strong, completely lightweight, and um, he believes could change the face of the developing world. So it's made from cardboard, and he says it can be made from, it can cost just $15 to manufacture. It's super strong, it can carry someone who weighs up to 220 kilograms. He paints it with a, uh, a water resistant resin, so it's also waterproof. And I'm not sure how cheap this is, but he believes it could sell for between $60 and $90. Um, but there's a great quote from him in a story from the Daily Mail this week, which is, like Henry Ford who made the car available to anybody, 
This bike is going to be cheap and available to any child in the world, including children in Africa who walk dozens of miles to school every day. So it's just, um, it's just a fantastic example of lightweight design, thinking of something completely new that could just be really fun, really different, really cheap, and possibly save the world. Okay, it might not save the world, but uh, Inhabitat.com is already calling it the coolest eco vehicle to hit the streets in quite a while. I'm here today with Justin O'Neill. He's the principal of O'Neill Architecture. And we're talking about Carabora. This is a home on Queensland's picturesque North Stradbroke Island. Tell us, Justin, how did this project come about and what makes it so unique? Well, it came from a, a sort of client who I know lived in Brisbane who were looking for a holiday home for their extended family. So the brief was to have up to a dozen people on Temple Beach holiday. So it needed a, a number of different spaces for living, uh, a lot a good relationship to the external uh, environment. And uh, so the house is configured around a, a central courtyard which provides all the flow through breezes to run through the house. Um, and it's generally one room deep. Uh, across the section. Great. And what materials did you choose, Justin, and what made you choose them? Importantly, 95% of the labour that built the house lived on the island, both supporting the local economy, but it's also a reflection of the quality of the builders and carpenters and tradesmen on, on, uh, that live at Stradbroke. Um, they're a great team. They work really well together. Um, so the standard construction over there is, is uh, in the frames with uh, FC sheeting and uh, cover strips. We find that it provides the lowest maintenance, long-term requirements for the building because it's an incredibly uh, uh, vicious environment. It's a very saltwater environment with a lot of rain, a lot of high winds. So the FC sheet on, on a balloon timber frame is actually the most um, the most suitable for the particular climate. And how does this type of construction, this lightweight type of construction, uh, how is it a cost effective? It's definitely, it's a very flexible uh, construction, so you can get a lot of detail built into the house very simply. Um, it's good for, um, uh, you, you just bring the timber over onto the island and it's basically then just labour assembling the timber rather than needing um, concrete pumps and all the, you know, all the, all the um, requirements that masonry bring along with it. So it's very much a sort of a stick-based construction um, uh, applicable to the island. And you mentioned earlier, Justin, that, that this island has some, has some extreme type of environments such as high wind and, and uh, a little amount of salt in the air. How does this design really fit into to the surrounding environment of, of, of North Stradbroke Island? Well, there's two parts of the climate. One of it, one one part of it is, is for probably two thirds of the year. It's the most incredibly beautiful and comfortable environment you could live in. Uh, it's you know, usually blessed by some uh, pretty gentle northeast breezes, um, and that would be for 50% of the time. And then southeast breezes that are not too strong for another quarter of the time. Uh, in, that, in that situation, the house sits up, sits up and breathes, and uh, it's basically uh, you, you just provide the opportunity for flow-through ventilation, and the, and the um, the wind does the rest. For the you know quarter to third of the rest of the year, there's a howling southeasterly, usually wet, blowing through the place, and it's quite unpleasant. So, in those situations, the house shuts down to the southeast. But it's designed so it therefore opens up to the northwest. So even in those difficult times, you can still have a large majority of the house open, but protected from that um, from the, the really violent weather. Our first question comes from Terry, and Terry wants to know what electrical work is included in a pre-built home. Well, Terry, we didn't speak with Prebuilt, but we did speak with another prefab manufacturer called Parkwood Homes on the New South Wales Central Coast. And they've said that all the internal wiring of the, of the prefab module is included. That includes power points, light fittings, and the mains box. However, when the, site, when the module does get to site, then you're on your own. That's where you need to get an electrician in to make sure it's hooked up to the grid correctly. Our next question is from Minaj, and he's looking for a lightweight alternative to a marble floor. Well, Manoj, we've spoken with uh, Anthony Melostic at James Hardy, and we've come up with the best solution would be a Scion Secure internal flooring product. Then it's just a matter of hunting around for the best vinyl membrane that suits your style and your particular tastes. Our final question comes from Benjamin, and he wants to know how you can build a 10-star energy-efficient rating home for under $250,000. Well, Benjamin, you're in luck. 
because next month we focus our new podcast series on the energy efficient home. Basically we find out what these ratings actually mean, how they can benefit you and how you can achieve them. Among uh, other experts we speak with one particular uh, building designer named Sophie Barrett and she has just built a 10-star energy efficient home in Cairns for, wait for it, $250,000.